So the American government, Lyndon Johnson, made a decision to send American forces to South Vietnam, justified on the grounds that South Vietnam was being invaded by the North. A lot of people didn't like this. And what happened was then an anti-war movement began to grow. And the anti-war movement to oppose the Vietnam War needed to find some reasons. Needed to find reasons to say that the American government was wrong. Where did they get those reasons? They got those reasons from the French. They got them from Jean Santini. They got them from Paul Muse. And they got them from a guy, Jean Lacouture. Jean Lacouture had been an aide to General Leclerc in Vietnam in 1945. And these three French and a couple of others argued that Ho Chi Minh was a nationalist and the great leader, and he was going to win. That there was no war about communism, there was no invasion. They also argued that the Viet Cong had, were a natural uh, uprising of people who'd been oppressed here. And therefore, there was no justification for the uh, American effort. These French ideas became the basis for the American anti-war movement. And the American anti-war movement ultimately prevailed over the American government and convinced the American people that the war could not be won. There were two propositions in the anti-war movement. One was the war was immoral. The other was the war could not be won. The argument that the war could not be won was that the Vietnamese people, in effect, liked Ho Chi Minh. They were nationalists. We were opposing the people of Vietnam themselves. The argument that it was immoral was a similar argument, that we were fighting against the people on behalf of a corrupt clique of landlords, rich Catholics, and, and lousy generals. Those two arguments in the American anti-war movement rested on this French analysis, and only this French analysis. So what happens? Well, for the first time, Senator William Fulbright, he conducts hearings. He uses his power as a senator to hold hearings to criticize the government's policy. He gives legitimacy to an anti-war movement. This would be today in Afghanistan if some senator held hearings to support the Taliban. So th this was, was creating serious divisions as to the legitimacy of the American government and undermining Lyndon Johnson. And Lyndon Johnson and others said, wait a moment, you're undermining us. And people said, yes, but you're wrong. Uh, the, um, the next thing was, we have George McTurn Cahan, The United States in Vietnam. This was a book that was used in teach-ins. Academics who spoke no Vietnamese, who'd never been to Vietnam, began organizing teach-ins in universities all across America to get young people, the young men who are being drafted to go fight, and saying the war is wrong. And, it be, and in, the, in 65 and 66, it wasn't so big. By the time you got to 68, 69, it was terribly powerful. Because this was the movement among, among the young people and academics who were supposed to be smarter than the, than the generals and the, and the people in Washington. And if you look in here, Cahen quotes, if we look at his footnotes, he quotes another French guy, Duvillier, he quotes saint -Denis. Um, A powerful book, national bestseller, Fire in the Lake by a woman, Frances Fitzgerald. Frankie Fitzgerald writes in here that all, all South Vietnamese are basically corrupt. They're bad people. The only good people are the communists. The fire in the lake is the corruption. And only when the communists take over is the fire going to disappear. Um, and uh, she ends up uh, as I remember. Um, Yeah, Vietnam today, in 2010, is probably one of the most corrupt societies in the world. Has one of the most corrupt governments in the world. This is what Frankie says. It will simply mean that the moment has arrived for the narrow flame of revolution to cleanse the lake of Vietnamese society from the corruption and disorder of the American war. The argument is we Americans are bringing war and killing and corruption to South Vietnam, and the communists, they're, 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 they're moral, they're good, they have a vision of the good. Now, Howard Zinn writes, The Logic of Withdrawal. Uh, the people around, some of the key Kennedy people around Bobby Kennedy, 
Schlesinger, Galbraith, Dick Goodwin, they write books and they try to influence Bobby Kennedy to turn against Johnson and turn against the Vietnam War. And their thesis in these books is that Ho Chi Minh is a nationalist hero. We don't have to fight him. We can, we can negotiate. We can have a deal with him. Um, now, this has impact, in, not only in terms of the anti-war movement, but in terms of particulars. This is uh, Schlesinger's biography of Bobby Kennedy. And in here, he talks about how Bobby Kennedy was moved by um, Joseph Kraft uh, to consider negotiating with the NLF. Bobby Kennedy and his brother had been militant supporters of Ngo Yem. Bobby Kennedy, when, when his brother was president, was the patron of the Special Forces. Now Johnson is president, and he's turning against the very war he and his brother uh, uh, really started. And he says that it was, um, he misunderstood it. And Joseph Kraft, by the way, uh, who is influencing Kennedy, that the NLF is the good guys, is the guy who does the introduction to Jean Lacouture's book. So you go from Jean Lacouture to Joseph Kraft to Bobby Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy takes on Lyndon Johnson in the elections of 1968 and is assassinated, but he forces Johnson to abdicate and surrender power. So these French ideas had powerful impact on dividing Americans and turning Americans against the war uh, in South Vietnam. If we read McNamara's biography, what he argues in here is that no one told him the truth. He never knew that Ho Chi Minh was a good guy, which is ridiculous. But the other thing that's interesting is that in McNamara, in McBundy, and all these people, nobody writes about the Vietnamese nationalists. Nobody writes about Huy Tin or Phuc Duc or the Lee or the Trung or, or the Dai Viet or the QDD or the Wa Hao or the Khao Dai. The Americans don't go out of their way to learn about the Vietnamese. And the Vietnamese, however, don't do a good job talking to the Americans. Um, but most insidious, the most insidious influence um, of, the, uh, of the French people um, is with, uh, with Henry Kissinger. Um, because Henry Kissinger, you know, let me see if I can look at the page. Now, this is his chapter on the agony of Vietnam. Um, and he writes in here, in June, I initiated another attempt at a negotiations with Hanoi through my old friend, Jean saint -Denis. The man who taught Henry Kissinger about Vietnam was the man who created the myth of Ho Chi Minh. And Henry Kissinger betrays us in the negotiations. Because Henry Kissinger never likes the South Vietnamese. He never likes Chu. He doesn't believe in the effort. Because he's learned about Vietnam from saint -Denis. The French colonial idea comes to power in the American White House through the mind of Henry Kissinger uh, later on. So this is the first time the Americans have ever fought a war with a major intellectual movement against the government against the justifications for the war. And it was fueled by a lot of baby boomer men who didn't want to go fight and die in Vietnam. They had better things to do. Another story, um, which it was a part, I think, of the anti-war movement, which people don't talk about. And there wasn't a lot of evidence. But it came to me in a story about Senator William Fulbright. Fulbright, who did the hearings against the war. He had a last meeting with President Johnson. The last time he tried to convince Johnson to give up and get out of Vietnam. And Johnson said, no, no, we, we Americans, we have to help the South Vietnamese. Finally, Fulbright, who was a senator from Arkansas, who never supported the civil rights movement. In other words, he didn't like black people. He leans over to Johnson and grabs him by the knee and says, but Lynn, they're not our kind, right? 
The Vietnamese are yellow-skinned people who don't look like us. Why should we fight for them? That's racism. There was racism in the American anti-war movement, particularly articulated by Fulbright. And the interesting thing was, about as soon as Nixon stopped the draft, a lot of the pressure of the anti-war movement evaporated. There was a selfish interest of a lot of Americans who were looking for reasons not to fight in Vietnam. And the French theory uh, explained it for them. Now, the American troops arrive starting in the fall of 65. And Westmoreland uses them basically here, 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 and here to go after the NVA units. Westmoreland's strategy is bifurcated. And I think there was a problem to that. He had, there was what we call the War of the Big Battalions, which was for the Americans first and then the Arvin units. And then there was the so-called Other War, which was the War of Pacification, Village Development, the War in the Villages. And what Westmoreland's plan was, which was the idea of Vietnamization right at the beginning, is the Americans would come in and fight the war of the big battalions, push the NVA out of South Vietnam, and then the South Vietnamese would have time, we would buy time, for them to get stronger and defeat the, the Viet Cong insurgency in the villages. Now, let's go back to Laos for a second. We were not going to invade North Vietnam. The, the, the strategy of pressuring the North Vietnamese was not going to work because they weren't going to give up. We could not go into Laos to cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail. What could we do? Our only strategy had to be a partnership with the South Vietnamese to build up the strength of South Vietnam. And the only way to do that is to work with nationalism. We had to find ways of partnering with the Vietnamese people so they would do things in villages and hamlets for their own reasons. So we had to find ways of working with the Wahao, the Khao Dai, the Dai Viet, the QDD, the Catholics, the Buddhists. And that's what we did under really Ambassador Bunker, Ellsworth Bunker, 67 to 73. And a CIA guy by the name of Bill Colby, William Colby. By the end of, by the end of 67, Westmoreland's use of American troops is largely successful. The base areas, the main base areas of Hanoi have been penetrated. They can't, Hanoi's troops have been pushed out to the, into, to the borders here, but not much has happened on pacification. The government of South Vietnam, 66, 67, of, of Vice Air Marshal Nguyen Cao Ki hasn't really done much of a good job. Um, a new man, there's a new constitution in 67. Johnson demands a democratic constitution and a political process. Two and other Vietnamese generals produce that. The Vietnamese constitution of 1967 comes out of the Dai Viet book, Young Tap Shinton, written by Professor Wee. So it's a very Vietnamese uh, constitution. Vietnamese believe in democracy. Uh, even Ho Chi Minh, when he comes to power in 45, he says that the Chung Nghĩa is, uh, there's nothing, the, the Ho Chi Minh thought, Tư tưởng Hồ Chí Minh is không có gì quý hơn là tự do hạnh phúc. Nothing is more honorable and valuable than independence, freedom, individual freedom, and, and, and hạnh phúc, good fortune. Nothing about communism. The other parts of Ho Chi Minh's thought are tan cum, tan cum, die tan cum. Victory, victory, great victory, right? And Duan Ket, Duan Ket, die Duan Ket. Unity, unity, great unity. This is not Marxist-Leninism. Ho Chi Minh never presents himself to the Vietnamese people as a Marxist-Leninist because, I argue, they don't like communism. Um, so we get to 67 and Hanoi has been pushed back. But the South Vietnamese government is not yet strong. So what is Hanoi's response? What's their next move? It's the Tet Offensive of January 1968, which is a secret surprise attack on the South Vietnamese. The South Vietnamese government and South Vietnamese units, military and police, during the Tet holidays, when half the army is, is, is at home. So there's a coordinated attack on midnight of Tet throughout Vietnam, hitting, hitting major attacks on Saigon and 44 provincial capitals and everything, the Tet Offensive. And there are two vital consequences of the Tet Offensive, one good, one bad. The good consequence, from the point of view of the South Vietnamese, is that the government doesn't fall and the people turn against the Viet Cong. The South Vietnamese stand firm. And they have to fight for themselves because the Americans are off in the, in the jungles and places like that. So from Saigon to Vinh Long to Hue got a little bit tough because a couple of NVA battalions get into Hue. But they can't, but, the, uh, but General Truong uh, 
and the core battalion of the first, Divi first Arvin Division holds against the NVA. Uh, basically, the, uh, the South Vietnamese stand against the communists and the Viet Cong is decimated. Thousands and thousands of casualties. The second consequence, which was bad, was that the Americans panicked and thought the war could not be won. We misread, because of our press, the significance of Tet. It was interpreted to the American people at home as a defeat. And a very famous story, Walter Cronkite, uh, the great anchor for, uh, for CBS, who was Uncle Walter, went to Vietnam for a couple of days, came back to America, and reported that this war has to end. And Lyndon Johnson said, when Walter Cronkite turned against the war, I lost 30% of the American people. So Walter Cronkite, in effect, moved to the side of the anti-war movement and the French argument that there, there's no good nationalism in Vietnam. Johnson abdicates. Gene McCarthy runs against him. Bobby Kennedy runs against him. Kennedy is assassinated. Uh, Humphrey steps in, his vice president. There's a bitter struggle between Humphrey on one side, the Kennedy-McCarthy people. Uh, Humphrey gets the nomination, and Richard Nixon wins the 1968 election on the grounds that he has a secret plan to end the war in Vietnam. Well, it turns out he doesn't have a plan at all. <laughs> but he gets in, and he adopts the plan of Ambassador Ellsworth Bunker, which is Vietnamization, which is to build up the South Vietnamese so that the American troops can withdraw. And building up the South Vietnamese was done in several ways. The core part of that was the village development rural pacification program, which we call CORDS, uh, which in, uh, in Vietnamese is the Chung Trin Se Yung Nam Thom. And this is the, uh, the plan, the 1971 pacification and development plan for all American forces and all South Vietnamese forces from uh, main force units down to village platoons. And this is the program that I worked on with Bill Colby. The man, the genius behind this was William Colby. And basically with this plan, starting in late 68, we defeated the Viet Cong. By 1973, early 73, the Viet Cong throughout uh, Vietnam was defeated. There was no Viet Cong. And um, I have some, past, some surveys of Vietnamese opinions from November 1970 and December 1970. And if you read this, the people are all against the Viet Cong, and they all think the government's going to win the war. And they're a lot happier. And economic development is going up, and they like democracy. The American purposes, which John Kennedy talked about in his inaugural address, had been successfully carried out inside South Vietnam. The problem was nobody in America knew about it. There was no good press coverage of this. The Americans thought, in line with the French thinking, that there was no nationalism in Vietnam, that the communist Ho Chi Minh somehow were the good guys, and we had to go home. Now, I suppose the next big thing to talk about is 1972. Hanoi's response um, to losing the war in the South, in 1972, they sent 152,000 974 new soldiers into South Vietnam. That's, that's like in, in, in 68 for the Tet Offensive, they sent 141,000 south. 72, they sent 152,000 south. This is a huge invasion. They, they have, they, the Viet Cong have been defeated. Now they, they cannot fight a traditional people's war. They have to invade, they have to use main force fighting. But the American soldiers have left. So now they're going to fight the South Vietnamese. It's going to be Vietnamese to Vietnamese. Vietnamese tank to Vietnamese tank. Vietnamese riflemen to Vietnamese riflemen. But the South Vietnamese are going to have American air power. And that's going to make a big difference. Basically, there are three attacks. There's an attack over the DMZ, violating the, the neutral zone, which captures Quang Tri and heads down to Wei. There's another attack in the highlands coming into Con Tum. And there's a third attack coming in here to, to Binh Long. And all three attacks are defeated by the South Vietnamese. The South Vietnamese army with American air power holds. The C, there, there are three NVA divisions uh, against maybe less than a division of Arvin soldiers here. Uh, and the uh, airborne commander, uh, uh, General Luong, and uh, Trung Nguyen, the province chief commander of, of, um, of uh, at Anlock, they hold out. And then the perimeter shrinks back. South Vietnamese and, the, and, the, and the, the, the communists are able to get tanks all the way down here. 
And uh, so they invade the little town with tanks and the South Vietnamese guys blow them up and hold off. In Kantum, it's pretty dicey. There are three or four divisions here against one and a half South Vietnamese. With B-52 strikes coming in at the last moment, the B-52 strikes just break up the, uh, the North Vietnamese units and this holds. Quang Tri is recaptured by General Trung. There's a, there's, a, there's a great story about General Trung, uh, Ngo Quang Trung, who comes from this, this Dai Viet Quoc Kim Dang tradition. He married the daughter of Nguyen Tung Tam, uh, one of the great uh, writers in, the, in this nationalist tradition. And uh, so anyway, Trung is in Saigon. Quang Tri is lost. Uh, the old, there's panic in the streets of Wei, absolute panic. As people remember in 68, in the Tet Offensive of 68, some 3,000 plus people in Wei were taken out and murdered by the communists. Another practice of murder that we talked about earlier. So there's panic in the streets of Wei. Thieu appoints Truong to be the corps commander of, of the, uh, the first corps up here. And Truong, uh, I heard the story, flies back, arrives in Wei like one o'clock in the afternoon, gets on the radio and says something like, this is Truong, I have returned. All men will report back to their units by four o'clock in the afternoon. All officers will report back by 5.30. There will be a general briefing at my command headquarters at 7.30, and tomorrow morning something or other. And there's chaos in the streets. You know, people are running around, guys are taking off their uniforms because uh, they're afraid the communists are gonna come down. And one guy shows up, gets on the radio, and gives a speech, like Lee Tung Kit, right? The old days against this, right? What happens in Hue in the next three or four hours? What do you think happens? <laughs> everybody, everybody does as requested. All the guys show back with their units, put their unit, all the officers show up, and, and everything gets back to order. Why? One guy. But, he, but this is Vietnam, these are the Vietnamese. He's got Trung, he's got Huy Tinh. He's got a sense of presence, people listen to him, they respect him, and he goes on to recapture Quang Tri from Hanoi. Once Hanoi loses Quang Tri, they are forced to negotiate at Paris. However, there has been a betrayal. Hey, where did that go? There has been a betrayal of the Americans and the South Vietnamese. And it was done by Henry Kissinger in May 1971. Now, Henry Kissinger, as you recall, in his book, uh, he thinks Saint Denis understands the Vietnamese. Kissinger has no faith in the South Vietnamese. He doesn't know anything about Vietnamese nationalism. Nothing in his book talks about this. He's impressed with the Vietnamese communists, Le Duc Tha and all these people. So anyway, in April um, 13, 1971, uh, Kissinger sends a, a, a cable to Ambassador Bunker in Saigon saying, we plan to approach the other side soon to reopen Special Paris Forum. Um, I would appreciate your personal views in this channel and the following. What should be in the package, including possible new elements? So Kissinger in Washington asks Ambassador Bunker to come up with a negotiating plan, which Ambassador Bunker does in this cable. Action in the White House, April 17, 1971. Exclusively eyes only for Henry A. Kissinger from Bunker. Okay, now, and Bunker has his plan right here. In his book, Kissinger takes full credit for the plan. He doesn't give Bunker any credit for coming up with the plan. But the plan is here from Bunker. Now, Bunker then proposes a two-step process negotiating with Hanoi. Step number one is to go to them and say, we're getting out of Vietnam, Vietnamization is working, we're going home. We got nothing to talk about, you've lost. If, on the other hand, you want to talk about your supporters in the South having some political, being given some political role uh, in South Vietnamese politics, we're prepared to talk about that. And if you want to talk, give us a phone call. And that's phase two. But phase one is you go to the Vietnamese and you say, we're out of here. You know, you, you had no more power over us. Your, your tay is not, you have no tay over us anymore. Um, and then, then, he, then Bunker says, if they want to come back and talk, uh, we have some other things to do. Um, and in particular, we would insist, as, and Bunker says, in his point five, uh, little six, on completion of withdrawal of US forces and exchange of prisoners, all foreign troops would begin withdrawal from the countries of Indochina. 
North Vietnam from Laos, Cambodia, South Vietnam, ties from Laos. Such withdrawal to be completed within six months. In other words, Bunker says, if we're going to negotiate with Hanoi, all North Vietnamese forces have to leave South Vietnam. They all have to go back. Now, what does Kissinger do? Um, he comes back on uh, May, uh, May, 20, uh, May 25. Comes back to May 25. And he says, other side has agreed to meet May 31. Da, 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 da. On your point six, we will say that the peoples of Indochina should discuss this question among themselves. No demand for the withdrawal of North Vietnamese forces. And Kissinger in this book writes, and if you read the North Vietnamese, as soon as the North Vietnamese realize that they can leave their troops in South Vietnam, they get excited. They say, yes, let's talk. We can talk. So Kissinger betrays us. The Paris Peace Agreements, which he negotiates without really briefing Nixon, leave North Vietnam's army in South Vietnam. And Thiel refuses to sign. Uh, I think one of the remarkable things about Thiel, who had a lot of faults, by the way, but fundamentally was a good leader for South Vietnam, he stood up to Henry Kissinger. He said, you have betrayed me, you have betrayed South Vietnam, I'm not signing this agreement. And he held out until January 73, until Nixon basically put the screws to him. And Nixon also gave him private letters saying that if Hanoi invades again, we will send the B-52s. But they were private letters. They were not a, a public treaty. Uh, so they signed the Paris Peace Agreements. Hanoi recognizes the independence of Vietnam, of South Vietnam. South Vietnam and the Americans win the war. They have achieved the independence of South Vietnam legally. On the other hand, there are a couple of NVA divisions left behind here. What happens after 73? Does Lei Zhuang, who's now running, running Vietnam, does he give up? No way. Remember, time, space. He's traded some space. He's given up space down here, and he's bought himself extra time. He now cuts a deal with the Russians. He gets massive amount of support, weapons, tanks, everything from the Russians. And they build a pipeline from here. All the, they've got gasoline flowing all the way down here. And they're bringing tanks down. In early 1975, they have a little test. They attack the province of Phuc Long, right up here. And they capture the province capital. And, oh, and this time, there's been the Watergate scandal in America. Nixon is no longer the president. Gerald Ford is the president. Kissinger is secretary of state. Um, they, the communists capture the province capital of Fuklong, and the Americans do nothing. The Politburo of Hanoi is in constant 24-hour-a-day session up in Hanoi with telephone lines down to the battlefield right down here to follow what's happening. When it becomes clear that the Americans are not going to send the B-52s, Lei Zhuang says, the Americans have given up, it's a, it's a taika, it's an opportunity, we strike. And so then they invade again. And they hit Ben Meitok, and they start invading here. But basically they capture Ben Meitok in the highway. Thieu now at this point um, makes a decision which is the end of South Vietnam. Uh, he makes two decisions. But basically his decision is to, to give away the half of the country to the communists and have a new border of South Vietnam right here, and to bring the main force units, the six to eight divisions up here, back down here to hold off. But the divisions are people from this area. The first, the first Arvin division up here, which is probably better than any North Vietnamese division, comes from people up here. If you take the soldiers in the Arvin first down here, they're gonna leave behind the wives, the kids, the mothers, the aunts and uncles. They can't do it. They're, 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 they're a people-based force. And so Tu gives the orders to his two commanders, and uh, Fu flies up, tells people to leave. It's a debacle. Everybody leaves here. They go down a narrow road. The communists come in, capture them all. General Truong comes down. He's told to, uh, to bring out the main force units. He, 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 he realizes he can't do this. If he brings out the main force units, he's loyal to his superior, but he's betrayed the people. If he says we fight to the death, I was told by one Vietnamese that in the city of Da Nang, there was enough ammunition for them to have held on for six months. 
in which time the Americans might have changed their mind, but who knows. Anyway, Trung's point was, if I, if I stay with the people and fight to the death, then I betrayed my, my superior and I'm not a good person. So Trung just, he can't make decisions. In the meantime, while Trung is coming down to Saigon and back, too, has sent another guy up there to give orders to start the withdrawal. So now there's panic. And South Vietnam collapses by uh, the 30th of April, 1975. And what happens after that is several things. A very small refugee effort is begun, which I started, uh, because the Americans had no intention of bringing any refugees out of Vietnam. In Cambodia, uh, we brought out 17 families. We left the Cambodians to be killed by Pol Pot. And some million, million and a half, two million Cambodians were butchered by the Khmer Rouge. Um, in Vietnam, in 75, we had permission from Teddy Kennedy to bring out 150,000 only. Teddy Kennedy, who had control in the Senate, who, by the way, had followed his brother Robert to turn against the war, he said he would authorize the same number of Vietnamese to come as refugees as we took Cubans out of Cuba in 1965. That turned out to be 150,000 people, of which only 130,000 could make it. And then later on, there had to be a separate effort to help the boat people. Um, so in conclusion to this series of lectures about the history of Vietnam, what was formed as a Vietnamese experience with, with values and courage and determination and poetry and history still exists under a communist, sort of a repressive, heavy, corrupt uh, communist rule. And the tragedy of modern Vietnam is that the French never tried to understand these people, and the French misunderstanding was able to be transferred to powerful Americans who abandoned the, the, the Vietnamese. So hopefully someday, the truth about Vietnam will be learned by a new generation of Americans, uh, more in the spirit of uh, John F. Kennedy's inaugural address than in the spirit of avoiding responsibility for the survival of liberty in our world, in our time. Thank you all very much.